It's Wednesday evening. You're listening to Mystic Moon Cafe with Wendy Schindler and Travis Short. Every week, we will interview guests that are experts in various fields of the supernatural, paranormal, unexplained, and esoteric. So sit back and let us take you on a journey to educate, enlighten, and entertain as we broaden your horizons. Now, here's your hosts, Wendy Schindler and Travis Short. You're listening to Mystic Moon Cafe. The views and opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, the network, or our sponsors. Stranger to the dark Hide away, they say Cause we don't want your broken parts I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars Run away, they say No one will love you as you are But I won't let them break me down to dust I know that there's a place for us For we are the Wanna cut me down? I'm gonna send a blood, gonna drown him out. I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, cause here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. That was This Is Me by Keila Settle. Uh, hi, I'm Wendy. You're on Mystic Moon Cafe. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's had a at least decent day. I, tensions are still Screw high. Screw everyone. Mercury, I hope they Mercury had a horrible went, day. Mercury, shut up, Travis. Mercury <laughs> went out of retrograde, so we should all be doing better and moving forward again. But, uh, you know, <laughs> Travis has himself stuck in the mud. <laughs> yeah, apparently. My retrograde doesn't move in, you know, forward motion, so I don't know. Who 
Who knows? What are you pouring? Because I think maybe you're close to where we ought to cut it off, you know, at least until <laughs> halfway through the show. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stop me. <laughs> no. Well, I can mute you. <laughs> you can't. This is true. Yes. This is true. Yes. I can be muted. I, yes. I do hold the reins there, but that's the only reins I hold. Yes. No. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, interesting week. Yes. Mercury in retrograde based on what uh, Cindy McKeon told us last week. No, and in some way, Mercury ways, is out of, of that's retrograde. What I, I'm sorry. That's what I meant. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, and based on that, many things... Uh, I have seen a change in the progress. And then some things are going, wait a minute, what? Shouldn't these be different? No. <laughs> no. It doesn't always work. We have... <laughs> <clears throat> I know. I know. It's horrible. Um we hey, have. Who would like to call in tonight? Because give oh, me your I number, know. and I'll uh, and I'll call you, and and you can talk to Travis tonight. And I'll just sit back and <laughs> and twiddle my thumbs over here, you know, in the corner <laughs> quietly. No, we we are here. <laughs> <coughs> sorry. I'm channeling my inner Doc Holiday right now. <laughs> um, we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you loner. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> You have no idea. Uh, we actually have Bill Bean who's calling in tonight. Um, talked to Bill earlier today. Uh, we're going to talk about the exorcism slash deliverance, depending on the verbiage that you use, um, that Tia Bell talked to us about right before Christmas. We had Tia who actually assisted Bill. And uh, she talked extensively about her experiences with that particular Deliverance. Bill's going to come on tonight and talk about it because I have we'll, known Bill. We'll have him on shortly, so just uh, bear with yeah, us. Yeah, and, and I've known Bill for almost a decade. Uh, it was, I think it was 2010 when Bill and I met one another. I have never known Bill to be rattled, uh, rattled by a deliverance. Uh, this one did rattle him. And um, I think that is very telling. And so we want to hear about that. Bill's got some other things from the world of conspiracy theories to talk to us about. Um, next week, uh, Mike Nichols will be joining us again. Right. Mike, Mike was a great guest back right before Thanksgiving mm -hmm. or right after. It was the 29th, so I believe it was right after. Right after. Right after. Mm -hmm. It was the, the Wednesday night after. Yeah. Uh, Mike is there in Kansas City. Great guy. Uh, really enjoyed talking with him. Really enjoyed getting to know him. Yep. Send me a Facebook friend request right after the show. Um, uh, and we'll be covering uh, witchcraft or Wicca witchcraft. Yes. as it's changed over the years since it's revived since in the, the 1960s. 1960s. Yes, so about 50 the difference years. difference between of, traditional and eclectic covens, the pros, mm -hmm. cons, and of solitary practice right. versus coven work, so, and yeah. much more. Yeah, and I talked right over you. Neener, yeah, neener, you did. Neener. Neener, neener. Uh -huh. <laughs> so looking very forward to it. Absolutely, so, yeah. He, uh -huh. He's a lot. He's a great guest. He is. He, he is a very, very informative, very articulate, very engaging, entertaining. He's just a good guest. Yes, he so is. So looking, for, looking forward to having him back on the show. And then um, the, fo <laughs> the following week, apparently, we're having a roast. You know, and the the, the problem is I, I, I posited this as a drunken stupor uh, one night, and now it has taken on a life of its own. So apparently I'm going to get roasted on the 24th, which you is You know, maybe, birthday. maybe not, because everyone I've talked to is like, eh, we're not real comfortable roasting. I said, well, we'll just come on and, and do some <laughs> snark, and he'll be happy. It's going to be a snark fest. <laughs> a snark fest. I like it. It's a snark, not a roast. Ro well, kind of, yeah. It fits and us what's the and, and really, what's the difference? There is none. I didn't think so. Yeah. Zip, it, zip, it's just, zero, not it's, it's, what, it's, what, it's what makes them, It's what makes them be able to lay their head down at night on the pillow. Exactly so. right. Yeah. What are you, doing? Are you oh, or is that above no, that, me? No, no, that was actually the... Um, Heating unit here in my room. Oh, okay. It's it's okay. Good, good to know. 
Yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good times. Good times. And then uh, we have Nick Redfern coming back on in February talking about the Slender Man. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, we got a lot of good stuff going on. Absolutely. And we're just kind of, you know, just kind of taking it a week or two at a time. So we, we have lots of really great <laughs> guests in the works. So bear with us just a tiny bit, but it'll be fun. It'll all be good, great, and groovy. <laughs> did I just get sucked into the past? No, you it'll did not. It'll be great, groovy. I'm bringing it back. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Now, okay, I've bitched, I've been, and how's your week been? You know, it's a week. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm not giving you anything else. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Good to know. Well, how about... Good, e- good evening, Albert and Kimberly. Glad you could join Ooh, us. Thank we, you. We, ha- we, we have a peanut gallery. Yes, we do. It's just It's just beginning. Awesome. Yep. Well, I think we should probably go ahead and let's get Bill Bean on the phone. I told him, we would, yeah. That's. Uh, do we have a song to play? We can just bring him on. Probably we don't, unless you want to. Oh hell no! Let's just bring him on. Either way, tell me now. Do it. But bring him on, or uh, yeah, play a song. no, bring him on, <laughs> bring him, bring him on. You'll be nice. I would get you. I, I can't be nice. I'm not a nice person. Okay, I don't know which. I think that might be the one there. Uh, Let's see if this... Let's see if that... Okay. It's ringing, I believe. It's like Jeopardy. Alex (laughs) Trippick. Double Jeopardy coming on the line with us. Oh. Oh. Hi, Bill. Hi, Wendy. How are you? Oh, Peachy Keen. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. It's very, great very back good. With you guys again. Hey, Bill. Welcome back. Hey, Travis. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me back. Anytime and absolutely. You know that. You're one well, of our I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Boy, do we ever have a lot to talk about tonight. I uh, know. Bill, I need you to exercise yeah. Travis, if you don't mind. He's he's kind of being a devil himself, so he, he may go poof, but it's it's you know impossible to know <laughs> at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's been quite a dialogue before I came on, I take it. Well, yeah, but I did try to end the worst of it before I started the show. <laughs> <laughs> you can only do so much. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, what can we say? We'll just keep uh, we'll keep Travis occupied with uh, loads of information and dialogue. There we go. Unless he left, <laughs> we'll us. make him very we'll make him very busy during this broadcast. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can be misdirected fairly easily. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, Wendy, I tell you, I think you've had your hands full with him uh, tonight so far. You know, I, I need an extension of my hand so that they could go out there and smack him a couple times and get the booze out of his hand. <laughs> no, you, no, stop. <laughs> oh, no. <sighs> well, that's all right. We're we're gonna keep him. Uh, we're gonna keep him full of information here, so he'll have lots of things to uh, to answer back on, or many questions to ask me as I'm giving some of this information. There we go, and and there we have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's some of these things. Uh, I'll tell you, it's just I shake my head. You know, just when you think you've heard the craziest thing, something else comes along that. Uh, just uh, is is even crazier. Where so are you now, Bill? Or can you say? Oh, he can. He's he's back in Maryland. Oh, neat. <laughs> he, 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 you were supposed to be in Lexington. I was supposed to do a deliverance with you, and you didn't make it. Oh, <laughs> things change sometimes, and and I was looking forward to that. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes the client has to change the dates. And and so that's what happened. So, um, 
you know, Melinda will book these things, and then if the uh, the victim slash client has to change, then you know, at the last moment, sometimes they'll make a change. So that will be revisited again, Travis, and I look forward to that. And oh, um, I wish you could have uh, been there last night in New York City. Uh, it was, um, and I praise God for working through me again. Uh, to help that lady, but uh, it was very interesting uh, what was also taking place outside of the building, and uh, still scratching my head about that one. Wow. Can you elaborate, or, or is that more private? Well, I was, Travis, no, Travis and I talked a little bit about this uh, earlier today, and um, this, uh, I was in Manhattan last night. I was in the the area of Soho, and that's right there on Broadway. And um, I had to. It was very interesting just the journey to get there because for those who have been to New York City in that area will understand fully and totally what I'm talking about here. But for those who have not been there, uh, it would be hard to fathom the. Uh, New York City, especially the Manhattan area, it's it's one of the worst places in the United States that you can drive to or drive in because there's nowhere to park. And uh, so this is why a lot of the people who live there don't even have cars because they either walk or they have to take taxis everywhere because it is just, you, you would have to see it to believe it, you know, how many people live in this you know, it, yes, it's a large city, but it becomes very small because so many people live there. And there are so many people that work there, and it's just the hustle and bustle is just off the charts. And so uh, I went through a lot to get there. And once I got there, and, and I guess I should give a big shout-out to uh, to a, a driver by the name of uh, Eddie, and, and I thank him very much for he may be listening in. Uh, he was awesome, and he, he really did a lot to, uh, to get me there and then get me picked up and get me out of the area. But um, when I uh, arrived at the location, which was uh, an apartment building, um, again, in Soho on Broadway, uh, the, the client lives in an upper floor in the apartment building. And uh, I would say probably just minutes after I arrived, I heard um, this copter over the building. And I mean, you could hear it very, it, was, it had to be low because it was very loud. Mm -hmm. And so the entire time that I am talking with this client and then performing this spiritual deliverance over her and baptism as well, this copter continued to hover there. And at one point I said to her, I said, do you have copters, you know, here regularly? Or, you know, is, I wonder if that's a traffic copter or something. And she said, no, no. Uh, she said, this is just very unusual um, for something like this to be taking place over the building. So it continued throughout the whole time that I was there. And then when I was ready to leave, I called the driver and, and he came back uh, to get me in. So I went downstairs to wait, and I stepped out of the, uh, the front door of the building, and as I did, you know, you could still hear the copter, and I looked up, and it was directly above me. I mean, it was very low and directly above the building, but directly above me. So where I could look up, I actually saw this thing. And um, just amazing. And so the driver arrived a few minutes later, uh, got in the uh, the van. Uh, I could, there, there wasn't a sunroof, so I couldn't see through uh, mm -hmm. to see if the copter, you know, in fact had something to do with me. Uh, I don't know, but what I can tell you is that probably for 10 minutes after leaving I still heard the copter so I'm assuming that the uh, the copter was uh, for whatever reason um, and as crazy
crazy as it may sound, uh, had really did have something to do with me. And the reason I say that is, and we've talked about this before in past shows, that for many years, since 1995, mm-hmm. I have had these helicopters and this type of surveillance, and uh, even in my home, you know, uh, on a regular basis, these copters do come by or come over, and sometimes they're so low they will rattle the windows. So I don't know who it is, what it is, what they want. I really don't care because um, when we are in what I call warrior mode, we're in faith, strength, and courage. So God is number one in my life. That means I'm walking in warrior mode, that faith, strength, and courage. So I fully trust in him, so I fear not, because I know that God's with me. So whomever or whatever this is, if they have bad intentions, then uh, I fully trust in God that he will keep me blessed and safe, and he certainly has uh, all of these years, you know, as this has been taking place. But, uh, Wendy, this is... It sounds like crazy talk, but I actually have footage of this. I mean, I have... I have been to different places, and these copters would appear over me, and then I would be able to either get video of it or snap photographs of it. So I have documentation and footage of these black helicopters being over me. Interesting. Now, I, I always figured it would be me. I, I sign lots of petitions and am very <laughs> vocal in, in different uh, uh, political spectrums and <laughs> i figured yeah they yeah, I may be on when, the list wendy <laughs> wendy has this th- this fear that because we talk about government conspiracies she and i are going to be on some list well i don't I mean, fear I'm, those lists what i fear is and and bill i mean this, this is just me being quite honest is that um i i grew up with a catholic background and you know it was always speak of the devil and up he jumps so sometimes these stories of the exorcisms deliverances and things they make me very uncomfortable and it's i don't even know if i believe completely that way but it still goes back to childhood i'm like you know i just in case i'm going to cover my bases and and avoid it as much as i can <laughs> Sure, and, and again, we can do this mm-hmm. by the power of God mm-hmm. and having blessed assurance in knowing that God is with us and for us. And if God is with us and for us, then nothing can stand against us. So Very keep true. that in mind, Wendy. Every time that you you know get a feeling like that, mm-hmm. uh, just know that God is with you and for you. And just keep your connection with God strong, and you won't have to fear anything or worry about anything. God's got it, and He's I, got you. I don't generally. You, honestly, it's usually a blood sugar thing. Now, I've been diabetic since I was two, and, um, uh, you know, if my blood sugar is really high, say, late at night, then it, yeah. I think that's a paranoia brought on by that, as opposed to anything nefarious. Well... Let me pray, right. and I certainly pray this for you, that God will keep you safe and blessed in all your ways, and and may He continue to bless you with an abundance of love, peace, joy, good health, and prosperity for the rest of your life. Thank you. And the same to you. And also for you. And, <laughs> As and the Catholics would you, say, and I, right? And yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so, really, what's taking place in our world and I've had people ask me, you know, how how can you dig into these types of things? Doesn't it, you know, hurt you in some way, or uh, doesn't it make you feel a certain way, or, or uh, they wear you, you down. or something like that? Mm-hmm. But no, it really doesn't. I mean, I have to, as an agent for God, I'm also a watchman as well, so I have to know the truth. So when I speak about things, I have to be able to speak truth. And if I'm speaking to people, I always want to plant seeds, good seeds with them. But I also want people to understand the truth. And the truth is the truth, and there's no substitute for it. And sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And in this world that we live in currently... Um, you can scratch and shake your head on a daily basis at some of these things that are taking place. And people need to know this 
okay because some of the things that are taking place involves people who the masses are following. Right, and so yes. people, the masses need to know mm-hmm. that these people do not have the best interest of mankind. And you shouldn't follow them because if you are following them, you are going to follow them on a path to destruction. And really, that is one of the main motivations for me uh, to remain vigilant in this and so strong and so uh, determined to get the truth out to the masses before it's too late. Because I'm telling you now, as sure as I'm saying this, there's a great and terrible day that's coming. And I believe that it's coming sooner than later. And woe to those who have abandoned God, who don't want God, don't want anything to do with God, and who are following along with some of these people that are doing absolutely horrible and wicked things on this earth. Atrocities towards other fellow man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is deadly serious. Yep. And, And I say to people, you don't have to believe a word I'm saying. But do the research for yourself. Peek into this, into some of these things that we're going to talk about. And if you do, your eyes are going to be as wide as saucers. I mean, it's just, it's unfathomable that some of these things are actually taking place in our world, in our society, but they are. And that's unfortunate. That's, it's just so wrong. It, in an age of enlightenment, and this is going on. Wait a minute. Well, what it is, this is one gigantic mass mind control operation that's taking place for many years, but now it has stepped up to the point of just total brainwashing and mind control and getting the masses to follow along with these false idols, and they're going to follow them to destruction. You know, I find it amazing that, uh, how can I say this? First of all, as a man of God, I love all people. I have nothing against anybody. I would do anything to help anybody, anytime. That's it. I stand up for what is right. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. I've made many mistakes, and I would be the first to admit those mistakes. However... I try to do the best that I can do and be the best that I can be each and every day of my life. That's how I live my life. That's how I will always live my life. Mm -hmm. And I praise God for that. Um, However, in saying all of that, there are things that are taking place that are so disturbing and so mind-boggling that The masses of people follow along with some of these people. I'll give you a, a, for instance, here, the the, uh, Golden Globes. I don't watch any of those shows. I watch very little TV. But these Golden Globe awards that took place, and, you know, the theme was they're all going to wear black for the the victims of of these horrific abuses. And, And it really is. But these... Wicked and heinous individuals like Weinstein and the whole bunch of them, and it's a big network. He's a he's a spoke on a big wheel. Right. These women, some, are you know trying to make this powerful statement. Yet some of them on the red carpet, and you can see pictures for yourself, are scantily clad, half naked, dressed up, and they're coming wearing black, protesting these sexual assaults and all this, and they're half-naked doing it. So, uh, again, shake your head, scratch your head, uh, and then you have someone like Oprah, who the big thing is, oh, she's going to run for president and all this stuff, Mm -hmm. and she's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but yet this very same person was guiding people to Harvey Weinstein, her good friend, uh, go with him, and he can take you places. So again, 
you scratch your head and you go, wow, how can this be? Um, but this is part of the world that we live in now. So many have sold out, and I'm firmly convinced now that one cannot be in these high places, especially in the entertainment industry, without selling out. To some degree, I and, agree. Mm-hmm. And when these people sell out, they have to do horrific things, things I can't even talk about on the air. And they become slave to masters. Mm-hmm. And those masters know who they are. And there are people like Harvey Weinstein and people above Harvey Weinstein and, and others like that. They're running everything. And and these people who wish to be, you know, big stars in Hollywood or the entertainment industry have to be totally subservient. They'll either go along or they won't have a career. They'll get blacklisted. Or worse. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they might not even have a life because some of them end up dead. Right. But yeah. uh, what is happening here, uh, an underlying theme, and this is part of a mind conditioning into acceptance, it is, uh, they're, they're trying to bring it forward in a subtle way, yet not subtle, in a way that the masses can't perceive what is going on, but they want to make them think that it's cool. And they'll go along with it, not even understanding what it is. Mm-hmm. They'll go along with it because these stars are going along with it. And that theme is cannibalism. And this is part of the Pizza Gate, which I'm sure Travis and you have probably covered this, and I think we've talked about this before in previous uh, shows. Yes, I, I had to get I had to get clarification on what exactly Pizza Gate meant, but I, I assumed it was that, and it was so. Travis, are you still with us? I am right here. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're looking I, for input I, from him too. Yeah. No, I, I'm just I'm just waiting on Bill. Bill setting the stage. He's laying the groundwork, and then we'll we'll go from there. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so obviously we know that this Pizza Gate thing is the largest pedophile network on the planet, and it involves people in the high places from political arenas. Uh, to religious arenas, to the entertainment industry, uh, to the corporate world, to sports figures as well. And sure. so uh, these people are participating in something that is so vile, so wicked, uh, it literally makes me sick to think about it. And what breaks my heart is that there are innocent women and children that are being abused in ways, again, that we can't even talk about on the air. Right. And killed and tortured. Yeah. And I'm praying for this day to come. And I believe it's already started. Uh, But I, I pray that God will bring every last one of them down and strike every last one of them down because this is openly satanic. They are getting people to join into this because of the desire for fame, fortune, and power. Mm -hmm. So they are brainwashed into thinking that if they carry out these wicked and heinous acts, they're going to gain great power from this. And this goes right back to Aleister Crowley and and the books that uh, he has written, uh, that he had written, and... You know, the main theme of his message was, do what thou wills to hold the law. So anything goes. You can do anything. And furthermore, he wrote that, um, how can I say this in a delicate way? Um, uh, He wrote that the abuse of a child, especially a young boy, um, one would gain great power from that, from doing these horrific things to children, especially a young boy. And um, there are other things involved in this, certainly, that that supposedly will give great power to these individuals. So uh, that is the playbook. 
And so you have someone now that is a disciple of Crowley and Madame Blavatsky, um, a lady by the name of Morana or Morena Abramovic. Um, and again, don't take my word for this. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. Just punch her name into Google and you'll get the phone book about who she is and what she does. She calls herself a performance artist. Um, I would have to say she's a performance artist from the pits of hell. And I'm sorry to say that, but uh, again, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. And her fruit is rotten to the core. And so she's the Pied Piper for all these um, people in the different arenas and they are following her. She has these uh, dinners. They're called spirit cooking dinners. And uh, all the stars come out and all the people from all the other arenas, the political arena and all the other sports and everything else, they come out. And these uh, dinners started off like $10,000 a plate and, you know, up to twenty and 30000 50000 a plate. Now, I want you to think about this, Wendy and Travis. Think about this for a second. Even if you guys had, you know, money to burn, why would you attend an event and spend, you know, $10,000 and up per plate for what? Why would you do that? For, to, to position yourself to, hey, Travis, can you move away yeah. from that, that heater thing? Uh, I actually cannot. Oh, okay. All righty. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I um, we're, we're getting sound effects. <laughs> yeah. My, my, well, I'm I'm sorry. Th- this particular room, I have I have two outlets. Mm-hmm. One is right here. One is at the bed, and the bed's the other side of the room. So, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sitting at the table. Well, we're going to adapt and overcome. That we will do. Yes. <laughs> But, yeah, there, there's no good reason for these people to pay money to do that, period. And, and furthermore, mm-hmm. uh, the way they're getting served their dinner that they pay $10,000 and upward, you know, per plate, uh, during these ceremonies, you have these servants dressed um well, they don't have any shirts on. They're males. They don't have any shirts on. They come out. They're carrying these uh, stretcher-like type of things, and there are bodies on that. Now, the bodies, I don't know what they're made of. They're not human, certainly not in the public ones, but I'll bet uh, behind the scenes they most likely are. But um, some of these bodies are made of cake and, and other materials, and, and so the bodies are laid out on the tables. Again, now, picture this. These people have paid $10,000 a plate and upwards of that. Um, and now they're going to be served their dinner out of a body. So they have these luminaries come out. Deborah Harry, Blondie, she Ooh. was one of them. Mm-hmm came out in a red dress and she was the head mistress of ceremonies and came out with a big butcher knife and a dagger and cut in to uh, one of these bodies and then the servants served the meal out of those bodies for these luminaries that paid all this money for their plates. So this is the promotion of cannibalism and it is mind-boggling, and that is the theme. So these people are involving themselves, and they're they're actually probably not by their choice. Again, the pressures and stresses of Hollywood and the entertainment industry and the things that one must do in order to be in a certain place and have uh, a certain amount of power or uh, influence, whatever it may be, you know, they, they have to go along with the crowd. And, and so that's what they're doing. And so they are participating in this, and they are following along with uh, Morena and Bramovic's uh, teachings. And I have to tell you, it is satanic to the core. They are not only turned away from God, but they are leading other people away from God as well. And anybody that 
uh, you can punch up, you know, Marina and Bramovic spirit cooking. Punch it up, and you'll see what this lady does. And they just had another event. Uh, I don't know if it was in New York City or L.A. I, I want to say it was New York City, but this John Legend mm-hmm. and his wife, Chrissy Teigen, uh, are rumored to be heavily involved with Marana and Bramovic and the gang. And they just had this event there. It was like $100,000 a plate. And... Um, Again, Moreno was there and all the the, the usual crowd, uh, they were all there and had another one of these extravagances. And it's just, again, mind-boggling. Who in their right mind uh, would want to, even if it wasn't a real body, there's no way on this earth that I would go into any place and... I don't care if I'm spending one dollar or a hundred thousand uh, dollars. There's no way that I'm going to sit there and have my meal out of a body, even if it's just a mock body. Um, not happening. That's that's cannibalism. So where is the sense of uh, right and wrong? Where is the discernment to know and feel that something like that is? just not right and and yet there there seems to be no moral compass whatsoever and these people just blindly follow along it it is just it's heartbreaking it is so sad and so if we look at the scriptures in Leviticus uh, Leviticus 17 well, therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Um, and that goes for the flesh of humans as well. So we're not to, uh, and that goes Leviticus seventeen fourteen. for it is the life of all flesh, the blood, of it is the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood in no manner. Or any manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. So whoever, whosoever eateth, uh, it, sh- it shall be cut off. So, you know, we're told in the Bible that we're not to drink blood, we're not to eat flesh, and, and certainly this means human, And uh, but yet there seems to be no moral compass in this whatsoever. And it's very easy for these people to follow along because of their, I guess, desire to be uh, on top. Just sick and disgusting, period. And, I mean, it goes even further than that. It just, uh, there's some, are you familiar, Wendy, with... Kuru, Travis, have you heard of this? Kuru? Kuru. I, uh, the name does not ring a bell. Okay. Uh, Kuru is a disease. And this disease is striking people who are consuming human flesh and blood. Kuru disease is known as the laughing sickness due to the, uh, pathologic burst of laughter which are symptoms of the disease so here are some more of the symptoms of Kuru the person will have difficulty in walking poor coordination, difficulty swallowing slurred speech, moodiness and behavioral changes, dementia muscle twitching and tremors inability to grasp objects random compulsive laughing or crying and there are and again look I don't want to make any accusations against anyone I'm not with these people. I don't know what they're doing or what they're not doing. I'm I'm reporting what I have read and what are news stories, so I'm not making this up. But can I prove that these people, you know, like Hillary Clinton, does she have Kuru? I don't know. Um, she really had some sickness there for a while and uh, some displaying some really weird things. Uh, I don't know. But whatever the case may be, this is uh, a real disease, 
and this is affecting some who are engaging in these wicked and heinous activities. So, to further this, I sent Travis this information earlier um, this evening. Okay. And I just couldn't believe what I was reading. I I was actually sent this information. I thank Sylvia uh, for sending this to me. Um, The this is an article now. L.A.'s elite cannibal restaurant boasts Katy Perry, Merle Streep, Chelsea Clinton, and Anderson Cooper as members. It is called the Cannibal Club. I kid you not. Good Lord. This is a restaurant in Los Angeles. And the website is cannibalclub.org. And on the website, now this, I'm going to read this to you from the website. Again, it is called Cannibal Club. It says, specializing in the preparation of human meat, Cannibal Club brings the cutting edge of experimental cuisine to the refined palates of L.A.'s cultural elite. Our master chefs hail from around the world. The opportunity to practice their craft free of compromise and unbounded by convention. Our exclusive clientele includes noted filmmakers, intellectuals, and celebrities who have embraced the enlightenment of ideals of free expression and rationalism. On event nights, avant-garde performance artists celebrate literary figures and groundbreaking musicians entertain our guests. At Cannibal Club, we celebrate artistic excellence as the natural and inevitable expression of the unbridled human spirit. Wow. And you have a quote on, on the home. I mean, can you imagine this? No, I, I just, I, you I, know, you. <laughs> I can't fathom it. <laughs> um, I, I'm telling you, Wendy, I couldn't mm-hmm. fathom it either as I was reading it. I thought, this can't be real. So then they have a quote on the page. Uh, it's whenever a taboo is broken, something good happens, something vitalizing. So that's their quote on the. Uh, the home page. So then, if you click on cuisine, right, it says collaborating with visiting cooks from around the world. Chef cuisine Sophie Lafayette Gregory updates our menu with new and darling or daring culinary experiments. The meat we serve is selected from the young and healthy, consistent with the practice of cannibalism in many primitive societies. We view uh, anthropophagy as homage to the dead who are reborn into the bodies of their consumers. Each dish, therefore, is a study in taste and elegance. Now, just think about what they are saying there. Well, they're telling me that, you know, I could get close and maybe barf in a barf bag and send it to them. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, that's wrong, though. It's I'm, just it's wrong on so many levels that it's ridiculous. I'm thinking to myself, how can this be legal? Yeah. How are these people getting away with this? Where are they getting the human flesh from? Where the, Where's this coming from? How are they doing this? Uh, I'm just at a loss. Uh, I'm going to dig into this more, believe you me. Well, what's the answer? I mean, when they say these things, when they make these statements, what's the answer? Where do they get these things? Exactly. Well, I'll say this. There's 2,000 people a day that go missing in America. So, uh, But how legally is a, a, a place like this, how are they allowed to operate? Legally, and they also had something on here about um, a lady that had passed. She had recently passed, and she didn't want to be buried. She wanted to be uh, served and eaten, and apparently, um, that's what had taken place. That this woman was, you know, uh, it's just so disgusting. It's it's very difficult to talk about. But the reason I'm bringing this up is. People need to know. They need to know what is really going on in our world. And they need to know 
some of the participants in this so they will stop following these people. I don't enjoy talking about these things. I really don't. But no, God no. has put this wisdom and knowledge on me, and it needs to be talked about. Mm-hmm. Speaking of, can we talk about the exorcism slash deliverance of October 27th? Yeah, let's talk about more pleasant things like the exorcism you did. <laughs> yeah. Is that a meanwhile back well, at the gee. ranch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really changing gears there, right? Um. Thank you, Travis. Well, no, I would know what. No, no I'm, I'm serious, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> we had Tia Bell on a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and she gave her perspective on the exorcism but you know bill i've known you for almost eight years and i have never known a deliverance to actually cause you to pause or to i'm not saying doubt but to just affect you so adversely yeah uh, yeah there's this, nothing, there's this, nothing this, this no, this particular deliverance, for lack of better words, startled you. There was something about well, it that... It, it surprised me because... Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say startled because I'm not frightened of anyone or anything, right. but it did surprise right. me in the sense that that uh, I wasn't expecting it to go the way it did right off from the, the start. You know, I have a way of preparing for these things. And this, you know, the the preparation process was out the window because it had already began as the husband opened the door. So um, there so was, let, so, uh, you know, there was no type of preparation other right. than for me to advance so, in to work. So I, I, I want you, though, to, in our audience's mind, prep us for what you walked into. Well, um you know, went and knocked at the front door, and then the husband. But again, these are very good people, and uh, uh, they were clients of Tia, and um, and she uh, she had, had an episode with uh, the the victim prior to that, and that's what prompted uh, her to recommend me, and and that's how it all came about. And so we knocked uh, again. Tia was with me; she was there, and we knocked on the front door. And the, uh, the the husband opened the door, and the uh, the victim, his wife, I would say she was probably 20 feet away from him into the living room. And as he opened the door, I mean, she was already in full possession mode, and she hissed and growled, and uh, I thought, boy, you know, any preparation uh, for this, is now out the window how I would normally go about the process and so I advanced in and as I advanced in um, she was very agitated but was retreating and so I quickly followed her into the she retreated into the dining room area and I quickly followed her in there and at one point got her cornered and she had a glass in her left hand it was like uh almost a chalice looking thing and I think it was clear up the top and red down the bottom or maybe the other way around red up the top and clear down the bottom but she had uh, a necklace in there I believe and a photograph of her mother and she uh, when I cornered her she attacked that and she tried to hit me with the glass and I blocked that and she was trying to bite me and she spit on me and she kicked me and I had to take her down and it was just you would have to see it to believe it. I mean, uh, you know, in a real fight, uh, a real fight um, most times ends up on the ground, and it's over with in a matter of minutes, and it's exhausting. You know, I've been in many, unfortunately, many real fights in my life, and, um, you know, it's an exhausting process. Well, this was very similar to that, but this was, you know, times 10 of that because we're talking the spiritual. And and so when a person is under demonic possession, they become very, very strong because of these demonic entities inside of them. And I thank God that uh, his power within me was stronger than those demonic forces inside of her. 
And so I had to subdue her. And I mean, I had to hold her down and subdue her for, I know, 25 minutes. And uh, thank God Tia was there because she was able to assist me, uh, you know, with the Bible and holy sprays and all those types of things. And so it was, uh, so again, now think about this. Think about what I said about how your average fight goes, which is over within minutes. Well, this lasted for 25 minutes. You know, I'm on top of this lady subduing her for 25 minutes. That's a long time. And and so she uh, just was talking in other voices, and the voices are screaming, you can't have her, you'll never get her, and, you know, calling me all these uh, explicatives. And um, it was something that I'll never forget, that's for sure. And it's certainly at the top of, uh, you know, the worst demonic possessions that I've been involved in. And I praise God for working through me to deliver her, but... Uh, okay, I, 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 the reason that I have to ask this is because, I mean, for almost eight years, you and I have been dealing with the fact that you've been doing demonic deliverances. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this was the most intense? I mean, what... What I mean, you, you have had a, pardon the expression, a shitload of mm -hmm. demonic deliverances and exorcisms. What made this one stand out? And that was for me the one thing that was very, very telling. Both you and Tia both were literally, I mean, not terrified, but you were shaken. You you no. both were you you both experienced something. No, but you both yeah, experienced. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, this was another level. This was another level. I mean, and I had no fear. And, and believe me, but thank God I didn't. And that is the power of God. Because if you're in a situation like that and you have any type of fear, you exhibit any kind of fear, it's over. It's over. And the person that you're trying to help and you and anybody else are now in great danger because of the lack of faith and the fear. So no matter what, I always have to be in control when I thank God for that. Um, and I maintained control of the situation the whole way. But uh, it was very, very intense and it was um, definitely uh, one for the record books for me. And the reason that it was so intense is because the lady suffered so greatly. She was exposed to things that most people couldn't even fathom. And things like we started off the show, uh, she was exposed to some of those types of things. And so she uh, she suffered greatly, and she had uh, demonic attachment and oppression on her since those childhood days. But what activated all of this is when the um, mother had passed, and the husband told me that uh, someone had given her that necklace, which belonged to her mother, um, that's when literally all hell broke loose. When that necklace came into the home and then uh, upon her person, uh, that is when all hell broke loose, and that's when the uh, demonic possession started. And so, praise God that he worked through me to deliver that woman. And uh, Tia has told me that they're doing very well now, and I thank God and praise God for that. They're wonderful people. And I just pray that uh, they never, ever have another problem in the supernatural way ever again, as long as they live. And I pray that the only supernatural interaction or contact that they will have will be in the divine way. Now, Tia explained to us what happened during the actual deliverance. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through what you experienced from your perspective? Well, I mean, again, like I said, it started out with this lady trying to attack me, and then, you know, I had to take her down, and I was literally uh, holding her and subduing her for 25 minutes, and then that was round one. It ended, and then I helped her back to her feet, and then I had to take her into the... Uh, my plan was to get her into the bathroom to get her eventually into the big tub to get her baptized. And so I, phase two, I took her into the shower area 
very large walk-in shower. Beautiful home. And uh, so the uh, shower starts up, and I bless the water, and then the demons manifested again, and I had another physical struggle to get her into that shower. And um, all the different voices started again, and, and, and then just on my end, it's all binding and rebuking and staying in control of the situation. So when those voices would manifest and say different things, I would just have to shout, you know, silence by the mighty power of Yahweh and his mighty and holy name in Jesus' name. I command you to be still, foul demon, and I command you to loose this woman now. I command you to depart. And I have to say that in a very loud and authoritative voice. Mm-hmm. So again, by the power of God working through me, I must stay in control of the situation at all times. And I was in dress clothes, and uh, man, I was soaked, you know, from the battle back and forth, this water coming, you know, full blast that's on her. And, and that was the least of my worries was, you know, having my clothes wet. But, um, and she was right there assisting me, and, and thank God that she was there. She was a great help. And uh, so after the battle that took place in the shower, I called uh, her husband in to run the water in the large soaker tub there. And then it was a struggle to get her out of the uh, shower and into that tub. And once that took place, um, at one point I was saying to her, I said, I know you can hear me. I know you're in there. And... God is with you. God is working through me to take this from you. And God is doing his part, and I need you to do your part now. You've got to fight. So you've got to be with me on this and fight, because I know you want to be free from this. So as I was saying that, it really was reaching her, and you could feel the power diminishing, uh, the power of the devil and his minions that were upon her. It was diminishing. And so each and every voice that came out, I had to bind and rebuke and cast out of her. And there were many voices. And so it was quite a process, and it lasted for um, quite a while. But the end result was that once I got her under the water, so I started the baptism process, and got her under the water and then pulled her back up, then you could feel it let her go, literally. And she slumped. And that's what happens when people are truly delivered. You can feel those demonic forces let her go or let them go. And then they start to cry. And that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. She started to cry, and then she was free. And it was the greatest thing just to know that God had really freed her from that. And now she and her husband can move forward and have a quality of life. And may everything that they do and everything that they touch be successful, and may they be in God's hedge protection 24 hours a day, seven days a week for life. Now, this has been, that was October 27th, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at about three months in. Uh, has there been any sign, any indication that there is any type of demonic interaction, interference in their lifestyle since the, de- the deliverance? Not to my knowledge, the last I heard is that they're doing very well. And so, again, uh, I'll check with uh, Tia from time to time to just check and, and see how they're doing. But the last I heard, they're doing very, very well, and I praise God for it. I hope it stays that way. And, uh, again, they're wonderful people, and they deserve the best. There you go. Um, we have a, a question in the chat room from a man named George. Um, he says he watched sure. the, the haunting episode, The Mummy's Curse. And he's asking if that was yeah. a tough case to crack. It was, uh, and, it, and it, you know, the thing that amazed me about that, and I, my good friend Tricia uh, Dozier over there at uh, A Haunting, you know, wonderful lady, and she's uh, had the battle of her life. She's been battling cancer, and she's winning that battle, and we praise God for it. Um, that episode really took a strange turn because uh, Caleb, yes, was possessed, and it was one of the more memorable ones. And God showed me a vision before I even went to him. God showed me that this uh, this young man was going to try and stab me, and um, I saw it clearly. 
and I took it seriously. And uh, so John Drenner actually assisted me on that, and and we put uh, Caleb in a chair, and we put him in handcuffs, and so his hands were cuffed behind his back. And so during this uh, deliverance, this exorcism, uh, at one point I anointed his head, you know, with my holy mixture, and some dripped down, and he spit it back at me and on me. And he started to, these entities inside of him started to laugh after that. He had an evil grin on his face and started to laugh. And then I took power and authority over it again, just like I said to you a few minutes ago, you know, how it was with the other victim. Um, I did the same thing, you know, by the mighty power of Yahweh and his mighty and holy name in Jesus' name, I command you to be silent, foul demon. And I bind and rebuke you and cast you out. And so it was a process that went back and forth like that. And then at one point, uh, he had tucked his head down and he was, you know, he started laughing and tucked his head down and I grabbed him. I had to grab his hair. Uh, I grabbed a handful of his hair and pulled his head back up. Ooh. And when his eyes met mine, all of a sudden, he had this anguished look on his face and his head went all the way back, uh, looking up at the ceiling and this black garbage started coming out of his mouth. Now, I did not see, I felt it, I did not see uh, these black entities or whatever, but uh, John Turner said he did, and also uh, uh, we had um, uh, Mike Stevenson was there with his granddaughter as well, and Caleb's wife, and and they all said that they saw that, and so... Um, it was certainly one of the more memorable cases, and, and then Caleb went on to do very well. And the last I heard, he's, he's doing good and free from all of that kind of junk. But he had some serious stuff on him, and I, I felt that it uh, came from exposure to events that were taking place in the house and reptilian beings that were on that property in upstate New York. Uh, where he and his family resided at the time. Uh, Caleb had shown me a picture and certainly looked like one of those reptilian alien type of beings in the photograph. And for those of you who don't think that uh, all of this is connected, uh, I urge you to do some more research and study. Pray first and always ask God what is true and what's not. But then um, do your research and study. And again, you'll be astounded to know that uh, that that this is real. So the uh, spiritual aspect, the UFO aspect, and even the Bigfoot <laughs> phenomena, they are all connected. And so in Caleb's case, I'm convinced that it was the uh, reptilian presence that contributed to um, the demonic uh, oppression and attachment and eventual possession. And yet, in the episode, for whatever reasons, and I never asked Trisha about this, I'm, I'm grateful to her for um, airing so many of my case files. I'm the only person in the history of that series that has had a recurring role, and it's all based on my case files. It started with my own personal story, and now it's all based on my case files. So I'm grateful to uh, Trisha and a haunting for uh, airing these stories. But in, in Caleb's case, I don't understand where the, the turn took with the mummy thing or whatever, uh, because it was all news to me that, um, <laughs> that it involved, you know, this uh, mummy and all this kind of stuff. But Caleb did share quite a bit with me about the uh, this story and, and seeing these entities and experiencing physical attacks, you know, in his room and in the home, and then showed me pictures. And if the pictures are real, which I had every reason to believe that they were authentic and not doctored, mm -hmm. uh, it certainly looked to me like there were very large reptilian, alien-looking beings in the photos. Interesting. Um, uh, Travis, uh, 
Samantha Chambers wants to know if she can borrow that blowtorch that's in your room there that sounds off occasionally <laughs> to clean her house. <laughs> yes. More more than well. <laughs> more than well. Now, Bill, I saw an article today that a, another, and I forget who had it originally, but it was about, it was an article from 1923, and it was from Los Angeles, and it was, it, it pertained to lizard people and, and secret vaults and rooms yeah. and everything under, under Los Angeles, I believe it was. And, and apparently there are several colonies, or at least back then, I don't know, there were several colonies throughout the, throughout the world. Absolutely. I believe it 100%. And uh, it, what they don't talk about, you know, with that article is the Battle of Los Angeles. So in that time frame, mm-hmm. there was a battle that took place where our military forces were firing on an object that was in the sky over Los Angeles. And oh, wow. uh, there were lots and lots of witnesses and footage as well. And so it absolutely, in my opinion, ties in. Uh, to these reptilian lizard-like uh, beings, uh, right. either coming from that craft or other crafts that were associated with it, whatever the case may be. But I absolutely believe uh, that uh, some of these types exist underground. And furthermore, uh, and I can't prove this, I'm just saying based on my interpretations and my study and my discernment and my beliefs, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that um, that these entities are very real and they are some living underground uh, in our country and other countries around the world and there are black programs such as Dulce uh, New Mexico the uh, uh, the Dulce base there um, that these entities live many levels underground and they have been provided shelter and housing through black programs in our government and in other governments, uh, perhaps through the shadow governments um, that are enabling things. And uh, and I could go further, and it would tie into what we started this show uh, off with. Mm-hmm. And it's very disturbing content. Um, I don't like talking about it, but it is the truth, and I've studied about it for many, many years. I've had my own experiences as well, and so therefore, uh, I know these things are true, but despite the fact that they are true, the main message that I have is that no matter who is trying to do what, in a negative, adverse way. It really doesn't matter. Because if we are keeping God first, then God is going to be with us and for us. And if God is with us and for us, then no one can stand against us. So we must keep moving forward no matter what. And believe you me, again, I'm a very busy man. I constantly travel. But when I'm not traveling... I study, and I study about some very, very disturbing things. And if I did not have the rock-solid faith that I have, then I would be in severe emotional distress that would be putting me in severe spiritual distress over some of these things that I study about. But that's not the case. My faith is rock-solid, stronger than steel, and I praise God for it. So even though... We have these things going on. God's power will always carry us through. Now, I have to ask a question that was sent to me anonymously, although I know who it's from, but they want to remain anonymous. Well, let's go ahead and expose them right on the air. I can't. Um, (laughs) They want to know if an object is used in a deliverance, or it is part of the deliverance, can that object remain physically attached to a demonic presence? So the person is saying the object would be, what, used by the exorcist? 
No, that there is an object that possibly was possessed, haunted, whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's a good question. It really is because um, that takes me right back to the necklace and the photograph mm-hmm. as well. Yes. So what I had to do after it was over with, uh, the husband, uh, we, we went privately and I did a binding and casting out uh, over the necklace and the photograph as well. And then the husband was going to dispose of those things. And I actually uh, wanted him to uh, put that in something like a lead-type box or something and then and bury that. And so uh, the husband, I'm sure, did that. But yes, I had to do a binding and casting out and a blessing over those objects. So, so that was a good question. So does the demonic presence exist in the entity, in the, in the object? Yes, it or, 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 or is it the, the, the um, sentiment put towards the object? No, it, the demonic presence can really actually exist over something. So uh, <clears throat> there can be an actual demonic presence on an object. So we have to be very careful. And Scripture tells us to not okay. bring a cursed thing into your okay. home. Yeah. should be cursed like it. Okay, now here's the question. But okay, here's another question. A lot of people go to antique stores. They go to yeah, you, you know where I'm going. I mean, they 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 don't know what they're buying. They just simply go in. They see something they like it. And they buy it. What happens when? What happens? Well, it's very dangerous because uh, now for me, in my life, when uh, my wife and I bring items in or if I order something, you know, from one line, or whatever it may be, I always pray over that. I don't care what it is. And uh, if I were into antiques, which I'm not, but if I were, I'd be very, very careful. And, and I tell people all the time that if you're bringing something into your home, you know, if it's an antique or whatever, make sure you are praying over that. And bind and rebuke any evil or negativity that may be attached to it, cast it out and off and away from it, and declare it the object to be blessed, healed, sanctified, purified, cleansed, and made holy before the Most High God in Jesus' name. Uh, That's what I do, and I I highly recommend that others do it as well, because we can't take the chance, especially nowadays. Evil is so far and so wide now and so rampant that it's very easy to come upon people these days. So... People must be sober and vigilant and really pay attention and have that, what I call, holy discernment. Uh, This is where some people would say, oh, this little voice told me this, or, you know, I was directed to do this, and I should have listened to that inner voice and all that kind of stuff. That's holy discernment coming from God's Holy Spirit. It is holy discernment, and, and we all have it. And this is part of our connection with God, and we really need to listen to that. uh, Because if we do, it'll save us a lot of trouble. Now, um, George is asking again, he has another question, and he's wondering if you've seen the men in black, and do you believe them to be demonic beings or living people entities? Well, that's another great question, and yes, I have one experience for sure that I've had... um, Many experiences with being followed and seeing individuals that were strange, but one for sure that I have no doubt was a men in black type of experience. And that took place, uh, I want to say, in probably 1997. And it took place in Glen Burnie, Maryland. And I was... Uh, cutting a lawn for someone. It was a hot summer day, and I had gone over to this residence to cut a lawn, and I pulled up, and there was this, um, it was like a white van. It was out in front of the house. Now, the interesting part is the, the person that I was cutting the lawn for, no one was living in the house, so the person owned the home, but they lived in Virginia, so the house was vacant. And, and, you know, this person 
said, look, I'll pay you a certain amount to go over and maintain that lawn, and that's what I was doing. So I pull up, and I remember seeing this white van, and there was a utility pole in front of the house, and there was this white van. There, there were no markings on it, so it was just a white van with no signs, uh, you know, no company logo or emblems on the doors or anything like that. And the guy was in the bucket, and he was up on the pole. And so I, you know, as I pulled up, I'm taking my equipment out of the truck, and he's coming down now. So I'm pulling my stuff out of the truck. I'm getting ready to to go to start to uh, weed whack on this lawn. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy comes down. He's in the bucket, and he had uh, these... He had black hair. His uh, skin was very, very pale white. And he had um, a black, it looked like a black T-shirt. And almost like military-style fatigues, I guess it was. You know, it had the, the camo type of fatigues. Mm -hmm. And he had these thick black glasses. I mean, these are the thickest sunglasses I've ever seen in my life. I'd never seen anything like that before. And he was very robotic. And I remember saying to him uh, something like, uh, how you doing? And he mimicked it. So I said, how you doing? And he robotically mimicked that. How you doing? And I thought, the feeling that I caught was just like, this, I don't know what this is, but I know that this is not a human being. There's no doubt in my mind. And so I made, I went to the right and I walked away and was going to start weed whacking. I'm the whole time looking over my left shoulder and the guy gets out of the bucket, again, very robotic, gets in the vehicle and he goes. So after this is all over with, that evening I called the homeowner and again, no one was living in the house. He lived in Virginia. And so I called the uh, homeowner and told the homeowner about this. He goes, well, I don't understand it because there's no electric or anything like that in the house. There'd be no reason for any, anybody to be up there on that pole because there, there was nothing to turn on uh, or nothing to turn off. Wow. And yet okay. <laughs> there, there this individual was, uh, you know, in this van and in the bucket. I'll never forget it. It was... Uh, it was a bizarre experience, to say the least. Sounds like it. Wow, we. I've also had a person approach me one time and say, "This will be the last time I talk to you. Uh, you are being monitored out of Fort Meade, and you're under surveillance. And I will never see you or talk with you again." And that was that. Well, that's not cryptic or creepy at all, is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I had uh, the black vans, and uh, I recall one time uh, this this van that uh, pulled up. I think my wife and I had grabbed something from a fast food place, and uh, this van pulled up where we were, and then... I had taken her down to her work to drop her off, and then the van pulls up again and goes right across the street and is just watching. I mean, these, these things went on and on and on for so long, and, and this, it was really heavy uh, when my experiences with UFOs and many other things uh, began in 1995. Now, as most people know, I'm a lifelong experiencer, and I started out as a victim in my life as a, you know, as a young boy at the age of, uh, really goes back to the age of two. That's the earliest known interaction uh, with the supernatural where there's photographs of me at the age of two and, and having uh, uh, these, well, the, the one in 68 at the age of two had this tall black hooded entity. And then the next year um, had uh, at the age of three in 1969 had many beings in the photographs. So that's where it goes back for me. But then in 1995, I started to have frequent UFO sightings and interactions with non-human looking beings. 
And then, boy, that's when all the helicopter surveillance came in and phones tapped and vans and all this other stuff. I mean, it was, uh, I really thought that I was going to crack under that type of pressure because I did not have the faith back then that I have now. And I was not um, on the uh, walk that I'm on now. So that was not, so it was part of the journey, but I certainly wasn't where I am now. So um, spiritually and emotionally, it was very, very difficult to deal with. Let's talk about that for just a second. Um, you and I met almost eight years ago. Mm-hmm. We were talking about what you had endured. I have to ask this, I never have. In all of your deliverances, exorcisms, and the confrontations you've had with the the otherworldly and the supernatural, have you met the entity that tormented your family? Well, I have seen uh, many, and then certainly the one that I believe was the ringleader of that was that dark force entity that, you know, tall hooded entity with red eyes and I've seen that thing many many times you know in uh, in childhood and then uh, as I was going into adulthood and so but never had any um, dialogue or anything like that but the last I'll say interaction with what I believe to be that particular being took place in the year 2000 and that was uh, uh, my wife and I were living in Baltimore County at the time and uh, it happened at the residence that we were living at there in the year 2000 and so that was the uh, last interaction but I also have have a photograph of that and and for anybody that would like to see that photograph it's at uh, billbean.net or billbeanministries.com uh, just click on the photos and the supernatural photos and you'll see it. And I also, it's funny, before the show, I was going through, because I've taken probably a thousand or more photographs of bizarre supernatural stuff, whether it's in the skies or otherwise, over the years. And another photo that I came across that I'd kind of forgotten about, uh, I think I took that photo in 1998 or 1999. And something had left footprints there. So when you would come in the door, there was a mat. And you know how you would have the door mat there to wipe your feet or whatever. And, you know, sometimes it's outside the door and then inside. So we had it outside it and another one inside. So um, on that mat, we got up one morning to find these very odd footprints on the mat and and the footprints measured from toe to heel six inches now I wear a size 12 my wife wears a size 8 uh, these were six inches from toe to heel and the heels were pointy so it went from these uh, toes these toe marks and I believe that it was uh, five toes and the heels were very very pointy and I took uh, a couple photographs of that and I'll never forget it and what could possibly have made that I don't know but I do know this that I put my foot my foot impression next next to those uh, footprints on the mat and within, I would say, probably 10 minutes, all of the impressions were gone. So whatever did that had to have done it right before we got up. Oh, boy. Yeah. So that was the one and only time that I saw prints like that, you know, in our home, mm-hmm. and just totally bizarre. But we could go on and on and on. I mean, I go, this show could go on all night long, 
with the amount of experiences that I've had, the things that I've seen, the things that I've been involved in, and now, you know, certainly with my case files, it's just unfathomable. You know, when people really look at this, and, and Travis knows me well, and he knows a, a, about a lot of the things that have happened, and when you go back and really examine this and decipher this, you, you think, wow, how could all of this happen to one man? How, could, how is this possible? But this is part of a journey. And I feel that in my calling, which is my work now in helping others, that it was necessary for me to experience all of those things in order to be where I'm at right now. Indeed. It's, it's all yeah, it's all part the of the experience. journey. Yeah, to be mm -hmm. able to relate to those that are suffering in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are there, are there some things that I wish I could go back and change? Absolutely, but I can't. So I have to uh, worry about moving forward. And so I chalk things up that I wish I could change to part of the journey. <clears throat> we all have a journey. Yep. And our journey should be moving forward no matter what it is. It's the devil who tries to drag us backward. You hang on, Travis. Are... Hang on, Travis. Uh, George has another question, and it, it kind of pertains right here, so I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it real quick. Um, uh, George wants to know if you keep your case files confidential unless the person consents to tell their story. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, I keep the confidentiality, and if the person is um, receptive, and I don't even ask. I mean, if they, if they come to me and say, yeah, I'd like my story to be told, or I want people to know about this, then I'll do everything I can to connect them, you know, with media outlets or whatever it is that, that they would want, or uh, places that they might be able to speak and share their stories. So, yes, but if they, the majority of the people have to tell you, um, they don't want publicity. They don't want people to know uh, what they have experienced, and, and after being delivered from it, they certainly don't want to relive it again, and that's the majority of the people. And my question, Bill, and we've talked about this before, um, you do choose to relive and retell your story over and over again. Why? Because it's part of the calling that God has put on my life, so it's interesting in that I would not recommend people to do it because I'm always recommending that people move forward and I certainly go forward in my life but as part of my journey in moving forward being an agent for God who helps others I have to bring up the past and those past experiences to share with people to let them know that I have been there so I understand, you know, when a person is having these types of problems and situations, uh, we can connect and relate because I have been there. So it's, in, it's very essential and important for me to share these things, to let people out there know that they're not alone, that I have suffered these things, and look at me now by the mighty power of Yahweh in his mighty and holy name in Jesus' name. Here I am, blessed, sealed, sanctified, purified, cleansed, and made holy before God, and I am strong, and it is the power of God that works through me to make me to be strong. And I am somebody to somebody each and every day of my life. So therefore, I have to be committed to God in that strong faith. And when we are that committed to God, then we're committed to excellence. And if we are committed to excellence, then we refuse to lose. So that's where warrior mode comes in, is walking in that faith, strength, and courage, and having that attitude that no matter what happens, no matter who does what or who tries to do what, it really doesn't matter because God is with me and God is for me. So he makes a way where there isn't a way. Now, we have talked about Dark Force. We've talked about your ministry. But at the same time, there is a second, actually a third book that you released, um, Ten Steps to Victory. 
and really those those, those ten steps really are the, I mean, the, they're, the they're the trifecta they're the ultimate if you have these things in your life you should be living a winning and victorious life correct I totally agree with that and again this all comes down to faith but if we have that strong faith then there's no reason why we can't follow those ten steps in making God first and that's the first step uh, and, and having a better life now it does not mean that a person's life is going to become perfect because nobody has a perfect life. Right. Uh, my life is very good and my life is very blessed, but my life is not perfect. I have issues and challenges just like everybody else. But what the difference and where the difference is, is if a situation arises, I don't worry and I don't fear because I know that God's with me and I know that God's going to make a way. God has made a way for me so many times in my life that I've lost count. He makes the impossible possible. So we should always stay in strong faith and know that God is going to make a way for us. So, Travis, I'll go through the steps real quick if you want me to. Yes, be please. Brief about I, it. No, I do. Um, you know, and step one is to make God first and, and really make him first. And that doesn't mean that... Um, you have to go around beating people over the head with the Bible and quoting scriptures and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's great to know the scriptures. That's wonderful. It's a great thing. But I find that when people are doing that, they are trying to cover something up in their own life. And so we just have to be real. And I can't twist anybody's arm to do anything. Uh, I always want to be there to help somebody, but I would never try and impose my will on anybody or force anybody to believe the way I believe or anything else. Um, I'm just sharing with uh, the listeners and anyone who wants to hear uh, what God has done for me and how I live my life and how God blesses me. So step one is absolutely making God first, and step two is following the path and the teachings of Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. And um, step three is building your faith. And uh, believe you me, the closer you come to God, uh, the more you will build your faith, and the more you build your faith, the more the blessings will amplify and magnify over your life. And step four is forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is every bit as much for the uh, for us as it is for the person that we're forgiving. So, for instance, in my life, I carried a burning hatred towards my dad for many, many years, and I was thankful that I was able to forgive him uh, before his untimely death. He was shot to death in 1988 or 1987, I'm sorry. Um, and I was so thankful that I was able to forgive him because that set me free. So if we're holding grudges and, and we are in that hatred type of mode, it's a spiritual poisoning to us and we cannot move forward. We are in spiritual bondage to that. So uh, forgiving is essential. It doesn't mean you have to go and, and be you know buddy-buddy with that person again or whatever. Uh, but you can forgive the person and then move on and just continue to move forward in your life. And step five is finding your purpose in life. It's the greatest thing in life to know why you are here and what you're supposed to be doing. And for me, my purpose is to be an agent for God in helping others to become free and move forward in their life. So find your purpose in life no matter what it is. And the only way that you can truly find your purpose is to pray about it and ask God to reveal the answer and guide you to it. Uh, six is the power of positive thinking. And there really is something to this because we as human beings, we operate on frequency and vibration. And when we are on high frequency, high vibration, life is good. And we are in the positive and we are moving forward. But when we are on low, and I have been there. Uh, life sucks. Nothing ever goes right. It's like the black cloud is over the person's head. There's always a situation, a problem, a drama. And there's never an answer or relief. So it is essential that, if, especially if we're trying to make God first in our life, 
It is essential that we use the power of positive thinking to keep our frequency and vibration on high so we can continue to move forward and be a beacon light to those who are seeking to break the chains of demonic uh, oppression and attachment and negativity. At seven, step seven is setting goals. It is essential for us to set goals in life. And again, I never in a million years thought that I would be in this position. I never thought that I would be able to achieve some of the things that I have achieved in life. And I am so grateful and so thankful to God for this. And I still set personal goals for myself and I refuse to lose. So if I'm setting these goals, you better believe I'm going to accomplish them. And I hope that everyone um, has that type of drive and tenacity. Uh, There are some that uh, over the years, uh, I've had people say, well, how do you write your books? And I say, okay, here's the way I go about it. I outline and define. And I say, I'll set a goal for how I'm going to do it. I'll say I'm going to commit two to four hours every day and or night until the project is over. I will not deviate under any circumstance for any reason until that project is over, until I see it through. And that's how I do it, and it gets done. And I praise God for it. But there are others that have come to me, you know, with these questions and then they say, well, yeah, I'm writing a book, too. I said, oh, great, fantastic. Now I'm going to start that next week. Then next week comes, and they say, well, I didn't get a chance to start it. I'm going to start it next week. And next week comes, I'm going to start that next month. Next month comes, nothing. Six months go by, nothing. i got to get on that. Okay. And then a year goes by, and the person's still saying, yeah, i got to write that book. If we have that type of mentality... It will never get done because you're not truly setting a goal. You are just talking about something and words without actions are empty. Just like faith without works is dead. They go hand in hand. So uh, the step eight is to give, you know, to give with a glad heart, give to others do random acts of kindness for people. Uh, try and make somebody's day by, even if you're having like a, a lunch or a dinner or something somewhere, give a really nice tip to a, a waiter or waitress sometime or whatever it may be, wherever you are, do some type of random act of kindness that you know is really going to bring peace and joy to someone. Uh, and, and it brings me great joy to be able to do these acts of kindness for people on a regular basis. I go out of my way to try and do these things, and, and it's a very, very good thing. It's what I call win-win. And uh, step nine is to be grateful for everything, and I certainly am. I can never thank God and praise Him enough for everything that He has done, for everything that He is doing, and for everything that He is going to do for me. And I praise Him for it. I am grateful. I'm grateful to others uh, for their help and for the things that they have done. And so it is essential to be grateful and thankful and humble as well. And then step 10 is walking in what I call the warrior mode, which is faith, strength, and courage. And if we can truly walk in that type of faith, strength, and courage, we will never lose. And we will be a blessing to so many, and we will continue to be highly blessed and highly favored by God. So there you go. Ten simple steps to follow. And I guarantee you, if you follow them, your life will improve. Very nicely said. Sorry about that. I was waiting for Travis to come on and say something. (laughs) I was just going to say, I was waiting for Travis to come in and say this is a paid public (laughs) service announcement. Did we lose him? Well, I didn't think we had. He may may have himself muted again so that that blowtorch doesn't (laughs) sound off. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's been an interesting sound effect for sure. Very much so. Travis, are you back with he, us? He, no, there you he, go. <laughs> he, he was he was 
muted. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I said, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, but if we could take those 10 things that you outlined for us and we could compile them and, and compact them, what would the 10 steps to victory be? The bottom line, the whole, if you were to just um, put it all into one, then it all goes back to God. And if we uh, if we are combining all the steps into one, it would be to uh, come back to God, have your strong personal connection with God, allow God to give you spiritual discernment to do the right thing. And so that would be the compilation of all those steps into one. Very cool. The very past. Nice. Yeah. Very and, you nice. know, it was so, it, it was such a departure from the first two books because yeah. you know, the first two was disturbing content and, you know, hey, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, horrible yeah, yeah. and disturbing things happened. And, yeah. you know, I had to document it and, and write about it. So the, you know, the 10 Steps to Victory book was a real pleasure. Uh, because it's nothing but goodness from the first page to the last. So it was, uh, and it's something that I didn't plan on doing. Uh, God woke me up out of a sleep, and I believe that it was back in 20, 2013, late 2012, or early 2013. God woke me up out of a sleep on a Saturday morning, and he showed me the book cover, he showed me the title, and I immediately got up and started working on it because I knew that God had put this on me and wanted this from me. So I obeyed, and and I sat down, and I started to work on it, and it was designed to be a very small book. I didn't want it to be a two- or three-hundred-page book because I wanted it to be something that people could refer back to often and get through it very, very quickly and be filled. So not only is it in the book form, and um, big thanks to Annette Munich at uh, Stellium, books in Chicago, and, and she, uh, she is the publisher for the books. Uh, so you can, you know, get the books either through my website, billbean.net or billbeanministries.com or uh, Amazon or barnesandnoble.com, whatever it may be. Um, but you can also, if you visit my sites, you can download the, uh, see the video, the YouTube video, for free, uh, the 10 Steps to Victory. I did it in audio, and I did it for people uh, for free of charge just so they would go and listen and get filled uh, with the positivity that was coming into me from God. And I always pray each and every day of my life that I can be a blessing to somebody. Well, and it looks like at least Dark Force on, on Amazon is available for the uh, Kindle Unlimited uh, subscribers as well, so that's that's a big plus. So that you know you can read it with with your membership and and not you know if you if you're a little short on money you don't have to buy the whole series. Or is it just the just Dark Force that's in Kindle Unlimited? Uh, I really don't know to be honest with you, Wendy. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's all there or not. I really don't pay attention to it anymore. I'm so busy. But uh, I have given away, and, and Travis could corroborate this that I have for people that couldn't afford my books I've given so many away and I've also if someone sends me a message and says that they can't afford it but they want to read it that I mm-hmm. send them the uh, the PDF you know the internet version of it for free right. and mm-hmm. so uh, I've done that many times for many people and will continue to do so <laughs> I'm sorry, we got um, Aaron there in the chat room. She says, Travis's blowtorch is holding back any demons that might interfere with tonight's show. Be gone, foul demon, by the power of blowtorch. Uh, well, Travis is having, a, he's having an interesting night, and uh, he's um, yes. got Indeed. sound effects and everything else. So. That's right, that's right. <laughs> the holy war of the blowtorch. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, Sorry. boy. We're having right. a little fun there, so there we go. We are. <laughs> but now, my friend, how can people get in touch with you? Okay, so the easiest way, I want to thank you both for having me again. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be on with you and look forward to the next time. Oh, and absolutely. I pray that uh, 2018 is an awesome year for both of you and your families and for all the listeners out there. I just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, despite 
despite the um, way the show started with me talking about some very disturbing things, um, there's still hope and there's uh, still quality of life. So no matter, again, it goes back to what I said, no matter who does what or how they're doing it or whatever, it doesn't matter because if we are making God first, it'll literally be like we're Daniel and the lion's den to where... Uh, we might be exposed to these things, but nothing is going to happen to us. God will keep us safe and protected from all harm, and I thank Him and praise Him for it. For anyone out there who's suffering, uh, if you're going through a bad period, if you feel like you're under some sort of demonic uh, oppression, uh, or worse, or if you feel like you're under you know, curses, hexes, vexes, or spells, whatever it may be, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm a very busy man, but I'm never too busy to help somebody. And you can find me at www.billbean.net or www.billbeanministries.com, or you can punch my name into Google and you'll get the phone book. So I'm very easy to find. And you can email me directly from the websites, and I will get back to you, or my assistant, Melinda, will get back. And uh, I'll certainly be there to do anything that I can uh, to help anyone, anywhere, anytime. Perfect. Oh, golly. We're, I, I had had a thought there before. It, um, I, I believe it's, yeah, um, you're here, you're shining a light on the dark, deep, dark, nasty underbelly of the beast there. And that's that's the only way to cure it cure it, or at least, you know, start the process. Exactly. So we mm-hmm. have to uh, shine God's light in darkness, mm-hmm. and when God's light um, just engulfs and envelops that darkness, then these things scurry. And then I pray that God's giant warrior angels come and take every demon into custody and carry them off and deposit them back into the pits of hell where they belong. And again, we give God the praise and the thanks and the glory forevermore. Uh, and and I guess we could end this with a prayer. Uh, uh, Father, I thank you and praise you for this blessed and appointed time. And I'm asking you to help anyone out there uh, who is going through a rough time in their life right now. And by your mighty power, Father, and your mighty and holy name, in Jesus' name, I bind and break the power over Satan and all of his demons, all of his fallen angels, all of his unclean spirits, all of his powers and principalities, and all curses, hexes, vexes, spells, charms, fetishes, all witchcraft, sorcery, magic, voodoo, all death, destruction, sickness, pain, torment, and anything and everything that the devil is sending to anyone out there. I bind and rebuke it and cast it out and off and away from them and command it to depart. And I ask, Father, that you have your giant warrior angels come and carry off all of that evil and negativity and deposit it back into the pits of hell where it belongs. Father, we give you the praise and the thanks and the glory forevermore in Jesus' name. And there you have it. And guys, I want to thank you again so much. God bless you. Look forward to the next time. Have a great rest of the night. Get some rest. And we'll talk soon. Well, you as well. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for being on. And and fantastic talk, as always. Even if we did lose Travis occasionally to the uh, blowtorch of of death. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, we overcame. And we praise God for it. We we adapted it. We overcame. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I think anyway. <laughs> yes, we did. There he is. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, God bless right. you both, and good night. And we'll talk okay, again okay. soon. Thank you, Bill. Have have a good, safe travels. And, and uh, sounds like he's gone. Okay. I may be here by myself. <laughs> Travis, did I lose you? Huh? Yeah, I think I lost everybody. <laughs> ah, well, thank you all so much for uh, listening, being in the chat room. Bill is a fantastic, uh, fantastic guest. Uh, we have him on whenever he, he says, hey, I got something I need to talk about. And uh, it, it gets pretty deep. It gets pretty darn deep. <laughs> well thank you yeah thank you so much in the chat room you've, you've made it very interesting and entertaining and and wonderful thank you thank you thank you um 
Well, I may go ahead and and cut us out of here a little bit early then. Like like we said, next week we have uh, uh, Mike Nichols, and um, he is he's a parapsychologist, and <laughs> uh, and and uh, he's a little bit older um, from the Kansas City area. He lectures, he teaches, he he's really extremely interesting and nice to talk to. Highly, highly intelligent and and well read. Um, he he knows his business, buddy. Hope you'll join us for that. <laughs> and uh, yes, guys, thank you, uh, Samantha, Aaron, um, everybody, everybody involved. It it was a great chat evening um albert and kim kimberly yes thank you all so much and well let me see i think i will take us out of here with brick fields i do not row alone and uh and that'll take us that'll end us for this evening thank you all um if you're getting the storms that are coming in i know that you know we're expecting in kansas City a, a bunch of rain possibly thunderstorms uh maybe ice storms as well everybody stay safe stay dry stay you know warm everybody everybody everywhere this is what i wish for them and here goes brick fields which is actually uh rachel fields um she's a blues artist out of arkansas good night everybody broken down on the ways to Jordan All on the dusty shoulder Lord I have fallen Though I roll down this earthly river I do not roll alone I do not roll alone the fear that's hated by the ways of the world by the heavy weighted still I roll down this earthly river I do not roll alone I do not roll alone tears and the fears and the darkness calling heaven awaits for the love of the faithful for the heart of the living that's embraced by the grateful oh I know I know my my Lord is I know he will not leave me Though I roll, roll down this earthly river I do not roll alone I do not roll
Thank you for joining us tonight. You've been listening to Mystic Moon Cafe. Join us every Wednesday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. On behalf of Wendy Schindler, this is Travis Short saying have a great rest of your week. Yeah, that's all, folks.